a few previous episodes of this channel, you may have seen the evolution of this miniature imaging rig setup. It was recently completed by incorporating the Mini Tasik 11 Harmonic Drive equatorial mount. Not including the tripod, the imaging rig, which I now call Minimax, weighs less than 10 pounds. That is not the optical tube assembly I'm talking about. That's the entire imaging rig, including the mount. Recently, I was really anxious to employ the rig in an actual astrophotography travel experience. And on November 3rd, I got my chance. Although there was nearly a full moon on this particular night. The skies were clear and the temperatures moderate, and I felt this was my last chance to image Comet Lemon from a darker sky location. So I packed up all my gear, shown here on the left. It was kept as minimal as possible. I had to bring two tripods because I always carry my Canon EOS R8 camera with me to document the experience and get contents for videos like this one. Shown on the right here are all the same equipment protected in padded cases and ready to be gathered into a backpack for my planned trip on public transportation. On this night, my intention was to spend only the evening doing astrophotography, so I brought along my smallest Celestron power tank, which gives me enough energy for about four to five hours of imaging time with this rig. To capture Comet Lemon, I needed a dark place with a view to the west and not too far away so I could make it back on the same night. Therefore, the destination was obvious. It had to be Jogashima Island again. It has great views to the west and south. My backpack was able to contain everything. It totaled only 15.6 kilograms, the smallest load I ever had for this kind of imaging trip. Besides the obtrusive moon, another issue on this night was going to be the wind. It was a blustery night with winds coming from the north, perhaps even above 20 miles per hour. But there was good news, the direction. The ocean was on the south side of the island, which had high cliffs, and my target was in the southwest. So my idea was to set up low to the beach, using the cliffs at my back to block the winds from the north. So, as you can see, I made it here to Jogashima Park. Took about an hour and a half by the train and bus. I'm heading down to the beach, and uh, it's gonna be a beautiful night. But my time's limited, only about two or three hours of imaging. Nevertheless, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for joining me. Although I have been to Jogashima many times, I have not yet explored all of this island or park. So I just picked a logical area based on the map and set off to evaluate it. It had to offer rocky stable ground for the tripod, with low views of the horizon since my setup was small and hugging the ground under the wind. I found the perfect place. Hands down, the location I selected was absolutely the most stunning and exciting location I have ever done any astrophotography before. It was an adrenaline rush just being there under the stars and bathed in moonlight. Actually, this night, the moonlight was kind of welcome since at this rugged shoreline perch, one wrong step would mean a five meter drop down to the rocky waterline below. The moon aided visibility and safety. Indeed, I had caution on my mind all night long. But the views, the waves, the sounds, the sense of danger. It was fantastic. It was the main reason I wanted to make this video, to remember it. I'm not going to dwell too much on the imaging results. The images were good, but not particularly impressive. 
Besides, I was still playing around and getting to know this Taseek mount in my new Minimax imaging rig and its nuances and issues. We're all set up and ready to go, just waiting for darkness so I can polar align. Obviously, I won't be able to do a standard polar alignment to the north since this is the north. But an all-sky polar alignment should work fine. The moon just rising above the cliffs up there. Not surprisingly, once the sun set, no one ventured down here in the dark. Although before then, I did get some visitors who were curious about my telescope and imaging plans. In September and October of this year, Comet Lemon developed into a beautiful astrophotography target with a magnificent ion and dust tail. But it was mostly the southern latitudes and southern hemisphere that got to appreciate it, as usual. Up here in the Tokyo area, the opportunities have been limited. With this OTA configuration, Movements of the William Optics Latitude Wedge for polar alignment is way more touchy than my other mount, the AM5. So I settled for these alignment numbers. I reasoned they were good enough since I would employ guiding. I then used a Badenoff mask and did a fine focus on the star Rosselhaag, followed by a guiding calibration. After all that, I tested a 30 second exposure on the same star with and without guiding to ascertain the quality of my polar alignment. It looked okay. There was some minor star trailing, but I knew that guiding would take care of that small issue. Time was of the essence, and I did not want to mess around chasing a perfect polar alignment and waste time. Also, I decided to be safe and use a dew heater here at the beach. My experience has been that despite the forecasted low humidity, Near to the water, the local microclimate is often different. I then slewed to the comet Lemon and captured 90 second subframes between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock p.m. During this time, the comet was found between 16 and 5 degrees above the ocean horizon. Notice the angle of the OTA in the photo shown here. On this night, I simply relied on the IR cut sensor cover glass embedded in the 585 MC air camera. No other filter was employed for imaging the comet. While I was imaging, I took a series of snapshots with my Canon EOS R8 camera. And this is what a single unedited image looked like. This photo was a stack of 16 images made using Deep Sky Stacker. I enhanced the photo a little for brightness and contrast. Can you see the comet? The comet is right there in the red circle. Here is a slight magnification of that circle region. During this time, I pulled out my 10x 42mm binoculars in hope of catching a glimpse of the comet with my own two eyes. At magnitude 10, I was not so confident it could be seen. But lo and behold, there it was. Dim and slightly fuzzy, but recognizable. Clearly not a star. It had a fuzzy tail that could be seen, but only by using your averted vision. It was satisfying to find and actually observe it across Sagami Bay and over the Izu Peninsula. And here is a single screen capture image of the comet taken on my Samsung SmartPad, a 90 second exposure. The comet was quite bright in the field of view, but the tail had diminished substantially from the previous images I saw online. Guiding accuracy numbers were a little bit high between 2 and 3 arc seconds RMS error. I think we can attribute that to the very low angle for imaging close to the horizon. 
but it was consistent and my stars were quite round, so there were no real issues. However, I had some problems stacking the comet images in Deep Sky Stacker. I was getting strange green geometric artifacts around the comet core. I think maybe the exposure and size of the core was the problem. Perhaps I should have limited my exposure time to only 30 seconds or so, not 90 seconds. It turns out the best results came from stacking only 4 images or 9 minutes of integration. You have been looking at the photo developed in GIMP to the best of my ability. Icons of the other software I used are also shown. If you follow this channel, perhaps you remember that I previously, actually two weeks prior, imaged not Lemon but Comet Swan also here at Jogashima and published that in episode 64. At that time I used my AM5 mount with my biggest refractor telescope at 448 millimeters focal length. Tonight I decided to target Comet Swan again. Swan was not low to the horizon as it was before, but actually located high in the sky as you can see from these imaging rig photos. Its altitude, surprisingly, was up at around 55 degrees and perhaps in a slightly darker region of the sky away from the horizon. Here is my processed image of Comet Swan. By this time it was almost 60 million kilometers distant and fading out of sight. Not very spectacular, but nevertheless still there. These are the images of Swan taken on two different occasions. Cropped and shown on the right is the image from this night, and shown on the left is the image of Swan taken on October 17th using the 533MC Pro color camera. The focal lengths and fields of view are obviously very different. With less than an hour of time remaining for catching the return transportation, I couldn't really do any serious imaging anymore. So for fun, I turned to SH2-101 the Tulip Nebula. This object is definitely not a broadband target. For the Tulip, I should have used my Optolong L-Extreme dual narrowband filter, but there was only a few minutes left and I was quite curious. Actually, the density of stars around this target up there in Cygnus was rather amazing. Here is just a 12-minute integrated photo and only a hint of the red emission nebula was visible. And then I found a broadband target nearby to Comet Swan, the M2 star cluster. The total integration time on this target was 10 minutes. With this telescope at 180 millimeter focal length, it's clearly not a good target. The star cluster looks rather small in the field of view. With one backpack and the limited equipment I brought, I figured that only 30 minutes would be necessary to repack it and hike back to the bus stop. That was a serious underestimate. It turned out that I was pressed for time, and after a few final glances back at this beautiful imaging site, I hurriedly climbed the steps back up to the park, pushing my cardio to the limit, and made my way back to the bus stop, barely, just in time, to get the bus back to Misakikuchi Station. At the station convenience store, I bought some hot coffee and leisurely boarded the train. As you can see, it was rather empty for the ride back to Yokohama. I was home by around 11.30 p.m. I really enjoyed the night and especially the imaging location, being alone communing with nature. The Minimax imaging rig worked as expected and proved its reliability. Here is one final look at the four images I managed to capture on this night. I love this portable deep sky imaging setup. It's something I can bring along almost anywhere. Thanks so much for joining me on this adventure. I'm JP Astro Guy. Located here in Japan, I'm constantly looking up at the night skies. This has been Astrophotography Japan. Please leave a like or comment and help me grow this channel clear sky.